everybody. It's time for Tech Talk number 115 today. Tech Talk number 115 today. That's amazing to me. <clears throat> hey, Matt. Cash Chuck. Chuck Reagan from Georgia. I'll be seeing you in a week or so. Come on, sign up. Dave. Randy. Hi, y'all. Where's my man? I know he's on here because it's 115 times in a row uh, that some of the some some of my friends check in. Hey Ken. Hey Jackie. Alex. That was for you, Jackie, not for everybody else. Hey Chris. Martin. Jerry. Martin. Hey man. Hey, it's good to see you guys' name. Hey Brad. Jackie said. Tom. Kevin. Skeet. What a great one. Hey Dave. Hey, thanks for your input on helping out with stuff whenever I ask questions or post ideas. Thank you very much. Hey, Kenny. Bryce Corley, got the coolest name. Doug. Tom again. Yo. Uh, I'm going to say Charlie. There you are. Whew. My heart went, my pulse rate went up about 10 since it was like 601 before you said hello. Uh, thank you for checking in. Hey, Michael. Guy. Alan. Chris. Randy, man, cool, cool. Got some good names coming up. So anyway, uh, I got some some ideas that I wanted to share with you. I, I want to say, hey, Chris, hey, Randy. I'll, I'll read off a couple of names, Ricky, Doug. I, I wanted to say um, that since I am whatever the good Lord put in my brain, uh, 67 years old now and I'm still alive, you know, it's really a miracle, really it is, because like many of you as a man or a male, one of the things that defines us, there's t several things that define us from women, but one of the things that defines us is our innate, ridiculous need to scare ourselves a little bit every now and then. I don't know if it's adrenaline or, or endorphin or whatever it is, but something in our, in our male psyche uh, makes us, I mean, I see stuff on the internet all the time. Like there's a picture of a guy working up under a car with a two by four holding a car up. He's up under there changing the oil. And this caption was like, um, this is why women last longer than men. That's one reason. A little bit dumb, a little bit ignorant. Hey, Kevin. How you guys? I'm on time for the first time. Uh, wow, must be off season for you guys. Um, I wanted to tell you also, if if you'll look, I, I'm, I, I took the filters off of my camera today. This is really me with no makeup and no fake faces and no fake hair. This is all the hair good Lord gave me. Uh, this is my beard, it's chrome, and uh, my old eyes are struggling, uh, but I can see you okay, and my ears are still working somewhat. Jackie says my ears don't work anymore. I don't know, that's just an opinion. But anyway, I was going to give you a little quick commentary on my opinion of what happened at the Dallas race this past weekend. I am not racing pro stock anymore. I retired in 2016, but since it is a passion of mine, and it has been my whole life since the class was invented, I still keep up with it. And I still have a few little things, my finger in the ring a little bit. I help a few folks and I'm always up for suggestions and uh, opinions. So I got friends out there. I got more friends that don't race pro stock. I have less. If there's 20 guys that race pro stock or girls, um, not many of them are my friends. I don't know why. It's okay. It's okay. All about competition, you know. Hey, Terrence. Hey, Matthew. Um, but I keep up with it. And... I'm, I'm a huge fan of the pro stock category. Uh, and, and the reason is, it's the same reason I like Greg Anderson and Erica Enders and those guys' class is because it's all the power that humans can selective hearing loss. See there, Jackie, thank you for that interruption. Hi, Jim Kennedy. Um, ha, 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 that's funny. Anyway, back to the normally aspirated program. I love nitrous, I love turbos, I love superchargers, but I'm gonna tell you what, man, just the scream, the wail, the, the effort it takes to turn an engine as high as it will go and have it make horsepower as high as it will go and to stuff as many gears in there as you can. Hey, Teresa. And, and get those, to get all that stuff dialed in to make power. So it's just a big, it's a super challenge. So the people that are good at normally aspirated engine development or or um, heroes of mine as far as development and technology. So I'm a fan of Pro Stock. I watch 
pro stock cars religiously. I watch the pro stock motorcycles religiously. I love the 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 combinations of um, the engines, packages, and the RPMs available. And the cool thing about pro stock motorcycle and pro stock car is they all have to run the same tire. In other words, they got a tire on the back, and they are at least the bikes aren't limited by RPM yet. But really, it's a heck of a challenge for the pro stock car guys to run with a 10,500 RPM rev limiter and to crowd all the power band up close to that as you can without going over it and that's a really nice challenge hey jim bob and scott and jamie um so being have said that my take on the weekend was, was huge weather swings uh just watching it i watch it online i watch uh, uh airdensity.com something like that where you can type in a racetrack and it'll tell you all the elevation all the grains of water, the wind temperature and direction, the wind direction the, and the speed and gives you all the little pieces. And then I do my own math and my own figuring based on you get four or five pro stock cars that crowd that last hundred. And then you go back and look at the pro stock motorcycles and you see who m did everything they could to get within two tenths of that pro stock car number. Like when Greg Anderson goes a 655, I expect to see a pro stock motorcycle go a 675. It's two tenths. Every now and then we'll see somebody dip 17 or 18, maybe a 17 on extreme condition. I think when you see a 1700s uh, slower than a pro stock car with a pro stock bike, that means a tailwind got them. Uh, if you see them slow down from two tenths to about 21 or 22 hundredths, the best bike and the best car, you have a little bit of headwind. But the air is the same. and Whatever the air is that comes to the track, that's the barometric pressure based on the, t the water grains and the temperature. And when the valve opens and the piston goes down, that atmosphere rushes into that engine. And it's the engine builder's job to trap that mixture at the right time, squeeze it the right amount, light the spark plug on time, let it generate the most horsepower, and turn that into power to the ground. So that's where my psyche is on that stuff. So I want to tell you that I watched some of that and... It was good. I mean, back when John Myers, the late, great John Myers, and I were winning in HRA races, we were over three-tenths behind the pro stock cars. And then uh, we snuck up into the high 20s. And it's a great barometer, not weather barometer, but a performance barometer for the tech department to say, okay, the best car ran this and the best bike ran this, and they look like they're lined up where they should be. And if one of them gets really far away from the rest of the crowd, then it's a good time maybe you ought to go to the barn and do some serious scrutineering. Just my opinion and es estimation. Because over time, I've been scrutinized and taken to the barn hundreds of times. And the people that get disappointed and upset because they wanted to go have a beer or they wanted to go eat or they wanted to tear their engine down, be proud you went to the barn, man. If, you are, if your performance is so no noteworthy and so outstanding, you should welcome the tech department to come in and scrutinize you in every way possible and uh, try and find out what's fair and what's not fair to the rest of the field. Also, my standard disclaimer here, there's a ton of things I wrote down. There's a ton of notes I'm going to flip over and show you in a minute, but I wanted to expl express to you that these are my opinions. Some of the history of this is what I remember or what I think I remember, and it's based on what I think I know. Um, there's not the only, it's not the only way to do it, but I have specific engine design guidelines that I go by that I wanted to share with you guys that will suit a single cylinder, a twin, a three cylinder, four cylinder, five cylinder, six, eight, 12, 16, all these engines, if it is a normally aspirated four stroke engine, it takes all of those, a single, a V12, an inline eight, all of them take four strokes and they're 720 degrees to get them all done. I don't care if it's a Briggs motor or a Ferrari motor, it takes 720 degrees of rotation to get all the work done for one cylinder. So let's flip over and let's look at some of that now. First thing I wanna share with you guys is notice that it is Tech Talk. 115, that's 115 weeks in a row. You and me, we met here at six o'clock Eastern within the minute for 115 weeks. I'm very thankful for that. I'm thankful for you to stay tuned and be interested in my rantings. 
uh, I wrote a couple things down I wanted to go over with you. I'll, I'll lean over here and say four stroke engines. I don't care if it's a one cylinder, a twin, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 16. Take 720 degrees. Oh, and those 720 degrees look like this. The intake is 180, crank going, pulling the piston down. The compression is pushing the piston back up and squeezing it. Power stroke is bang, let the crank turn and the piston go back down. And the exhaust is turn or crank and push the exhaust out. Okay, on my engine, my own personal ideas on engine design and criteria, I figure out the bore first. Everything else, whatever that is, comes after bore, my opinion. Now, the bore is based on real estate. That means gasket availability, ring availability, and the block slash sleeves. And please understand, you guys, this is a Chevrolet, a Chrysler, a Kawasaki, a Harley. I don't care. If you've got a four-cylinder Suzuki Pro Stock engine or a four-cylinder Kawasaki top gas engine, your bore can be the biggest it can be based on these things. And I'll say them again. Rings is number one. If you can buy rings, I know that sounds dumb because if you've got a, a, a certain engine you've been running and you always bought the same rings for it, that's cool. But if you're designing a clean sheet of paper from scratch, you can't build a really cool engine if there are no rings available. Now, yes, you can. I'm sorry when I said can't. Total Seal will make the rings for you. You're going to need twin, twin intercoolers on your credit card. You're going to need a really high credit score. And you're going to have to have a lot of cash. And you're going to have to buy a lot of rings. And if you're going to have one oddball bore size, you're going to have to buy a lot of custom rings. And if you want to, you can email me and ask me how I know. But I got some great stories of having to buy a lot of rings or trying to find a lot of people that wanted the same size rings I did. So I call Total Seal first and I say, I don't say the exact word, but what I'm really asking is what's the bore size, the biggest bore I can run in this setup? And they'll tell me the rings available. So if they have rings on the shelf or rings are coming up soon, let that be your guide. All right, head gaskets base gaskets, whatever gaskets you need that are dictated by that bore size, make sure you get with the Cometic man or Cometic or however you say it and make sure they make a, or will or can make a head gasket for you. Back when we started the, uh, when we were working on the uh, Suzuki Pro Stock project, we had to come up with new gaskets all the time, new rings all the time and new pistons all the time uh, because we were based on a GS1150 block and the Suzuki's where the stud bolt pattern was the same and still is. And the board to board, board center lines, going back to the bore for you car guys, if you have a block, a V8, a six on or whatever, it's the area between the bores. One bore's here and one bore's here. The centers of those bores will tell you exactly what is your, you gotta have room for a head gasket. So the block dictates that. Pro stock car, they have a rule. 4.9 inches center to center for spacing. 4.9 inches. That really makes a big difference. So the pro stock car guys, they bore the block out as big as they'll go where they can still get a gasket and get cylinder wall stability so that the rings will seal. <clears throat> then stroke. The way I figure stroke on an engine design or engine development is what are the rules? What are the rules? Like I'll find out what the biggest bore I can have is and get the rings and the gaskets and get that bore figured out. And then I'm gonna look up and see what's the rules. Like, what is the rule? 500 cubic inches, 113 cubic inches, 160 cubic inches. Whatever the rule is, we fill the rest in with stroke. Four inch bore. What's the stroke that will fit and make the cubic inches you want? So I let the, the rules dictate stroke. Also, the block makes a difference. Um, you can't just shove every stroke you can in there. And I wrote on this piston to remind me to say it. Just because you can fit a big stroke crank in there doesn't mean you should. Because there are limitations on that. The biggest stroke you can put in there, in my opinion, will be used only if you are 
like mountain motor stuff where the only way you can get cubic inches is by putting more stroke to it. Harleys have been that way forever. Uh, back in the day, you couldn't get a good cylinder head, a shovel head. Uh, you could get some kind of pretty weak cylinder heads. When I say weak, they didn't have ports at all. They didn't have valve size at all. And they had really small bores because the engine case had stud holes based on a certain size and there was no way you could put cubic inches. So the only way the Harley guys could do it was to keep adding stroke. So they would put, go from a three inch and a half to a four inch, four and a half, got all the way up to a five inch stroke. Some of the top fuel bikes now are running strokes bigger than five inches because that's the only way they can get cubic inches. And they have determined that cubic inches is more important than trying to get ring seal and uh, piston and cylinder wall stability. Third thing I do is I work on the valve size and the valve size is totally dictated by the bore size. I wrote down a note here is it's got an easy one. The valve size is dictated by the bore size. So if you can, if you can bore out from say a four inch to a four and a half, blammo, there you go. Big valves. That's your next move. Big valves is your next move. This is my opinion. It's not the only way. Note. No, 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 no. Not the only way. My opinion, not the only way. This is if I had a clean sheet of paper and you sent me the money and a credit card number with the two dual intercoolers to make the credit card spend faster. I would go with the biggest bore, whatever stroke to fit the rules, the biggest valve that will fit the bore. And then I'll work on getting the compression ratio I want and the compression ratio has several reasons. And I would design a dome, and that's another whole story another day, to get a high compression. What kind of dome would I want? I don't want a dome just to get a compression ratio number. I want a dome that you, we, we need to, my opinion is we should change our mind of what the dome really is. Because we, we work really hard on our cylinder heads to get a combustion chamber that has a beautiful shape, a beautiful finish, and it has this valve and this valve and this valve and this valve. It has spark plug here and it's all kellered out and all smooth and it's unshrouded and it has all these things they call, um, it is uh, been softened. And then they'll buy a shelf stock piston that looks like somebody used a hammer and a chisel and chiseled out this piston and it, the valve pocket looks like the valve domes and shapes and sizes and finish or the most horrible looking thing you ever saw. It's the floor of the chamber. Here's the roof, which we look at and care about. And your dome should complement this, not be something with a little bit of air here and a dish here and a little high side over here. I mean, this is a horrible combination. Remember, it's like this. Here's the floor and here's the roof. And the combustion chamber needs to be pretty, and smooth and happy bottom of the chamber and the top of the chamber. And the, when you set the head upside down on the table, we all look and work on the chamber to make it perfect. And then we sit the piston in there and it's got a horrible looking combination of stuff on top of it that totally screws up whatever that nice work we did in the chamber. Again, this is my opinion. Then after you get your dome and pockets, okay, I wanna say this about my pockets. My valve pockets, I don't want them deep. I don't want the dome high. I want everything smooth. I want the pockets real smooth. Here is a Kellard design piston. This has got, a, the machine did a nice job smoothing out this, this pocket. This is very nice and smooth. And it's got, I mean, like when you close your eyes and feel it, there's no sharp edges. It feels nice. This, if I was gas and fuel and air, I would love to light off and run all through here. It would be great versus some of the ugly stuff I see. That's an option for you, a Kellard dome or a Kellard piston. K-E-L-L-E-R-E-D, I believe is how you spell it, but I never was a speller or a scholar. Um, the valve pockets, again, <clears throat> there are pistons on the market for sale that have, I say, what pocket is that? They say everybody'scam.com. I just, that's a silly way of me saying that, but pocket is so deep that any cam you can dream of will fit in here. And another thing folks say all the time, they say, 
well, I only have a 600 lift cam, so my pistons won't be in the way, but if I get a 700 lift cam, I'm gonna have to cut my pockets. I'm gonna say something, y'all. I'm sorry, that's wrong. That's not right. The lift of the cam doesn't tell you how deep your pockets have to be, and I know there's a lot of guys go argue with me, but we only know what we know. If this valve opens at the same time with a 600 lift cam, as it does with a 700 lift cam, the piston is only near the valve at TDC. When the piston goes down is when the intake valve opens. When the piston is coming up, the exhaust valve is closing. These valves do not get close to this piston except near TDC, and the cam is not on lift. Here's your lobe. Well, here's your base circle. Here's your cam lobe. When the valve is near the piston, it's here. It's about 10 to 15 before TDC and 10 to 15 degrees after TDC. That's where the valve will get close to this pocket, not at full lift. So you can put a one inch lift cam in this piston without the valves hitting the piston as long as you have the TDC lift has room for the valves at TDC, which means the cam is over here and over here. It's not near full lift. That's another, another day story that I'll tell you. And I know I'm talking like to some authority and some uh, th uh, some attitude of some about my voice, but I've been going through this for decades and decades with people that read the internet and read the books and they get the Smoky book and they get the Horsepower Secrets book and they, they read all the stories from 1955 to 1965 and they've come up with these rules that have changed. Cubic inch rules are the same. It's bore times bore times stroke. That's your cubic inches, but so many of these other rules have changed tremendously. It's time to look at it in a new light. I put cam as um, my number five. Number one, number one by a long way is intake valve closing. I will put a note there to help you with that. IVC, IVC. Intake valve closing is your number one criteria on cam timing in my opinion. Number two is exhaust valve open that's number two by long margin number three tied for last place is intake valve open and exhaust valve close make sure i said that right intake valve closing the piston is so far down at the bottom the valve can't get close to it can't get close to the piston but the, mix, the trapping of that mixture I was talking about, when the valve opens and the piston goes down and the atmosphere from the good Lord Almighty of at Dallas at ProStock, he was pushing 29.4 barometer and about a 107 correction factor with about 70 grains of water, and it was about 75 to 85 degrees, and that was X amount of air coming in at this RPM, and you got to close that intake valve out of all the cam's duties. you got to close that intake valve at the right time in order to make the horsepower. Next thing that's most important is the exhaust valve opening. That's when the piston's going down on the power stroke. Piston's going down on the power stroke. And right when the power, the pressure, is in this cylinder, it's pushing this piston down and turning the crankshaft, right when it drops to where you're not going to gain any more work, you're not going to gain any more pressure, that's when you need to pop the exhaust valve open as soon as you can because it takes a long time to get the exhaust valve the exhaust pressure and the exhaust residue out of the engine. It is, uh, it takes 250 to 320 degrees of rotation to get the exhaust out. So you better start it on time because you'll be over here on number four, which ain't very important, trying to close the exhaust valve at the right time after the cylinder still got a bunch of residue in it and your horsepower per cubic inch and your efficiency level and whether they call it the, uh, my friends talk about it all the time, and it's like 120 is volumetric efficiency. One to one is pretty cool. 1.2 to one is very cool. All right, induction. After you get all the short block figured out and the heads figured out, then you got to work on induction. What are you going to bolt to the heads? I, my opinion is it shouldn't be a restriction. The intake valve should be the restriction going in. Everything else should clear the path. It's like if you're going to go buy a new refrigerator and you're going to call up people you buy the refrigerator from and ask them to deliver it and they show up at your house with this massive refrigerator but there's no doors in your house to let the refrigerator in it's the same thing so 
if I was going to buy a refrigerator, I'd get me a tape measure and I'd go figure out the openings from getting the, the new refrigerator from the store to its location in the kitchen or wherever I'm going to put it. There has to be room for it to get there. So if you're going to have this much air coming in through this size valve, make sure everything upstream from there is big enough for it to get through there. My opinion. Okay. The next thing after you get the induction figured out is the exhaust system. The exhaust system has a very complex job. At some RPM, it has to be small and, sh and long. At some RPM, it has to be huge and short. An, an exhaust system is only good for one spot. Everywhere below that RPM, it's too big, and everywhere above that RPM, it's too little. So pick out your length and your diameters of your exhaust system because it wants to get out, y'all. The exhaust wants to get out, and don't let this, it's the same thing as that refrigerator. If you get that big refrigerator in your kitchen and then you build a bunch of doors and a bunch of hallways and a back porch and a front porch smaller than the refrigerator, you'll never move it out again unless you take the refrigerator apart to get it out of your house. So I know that sounds really stupid, but I'm running out of time. Rods, I don't know how far below this is, it is but the rod length is a different story. It's a different, it has a different deal to me. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, a pro stock normally aspirated engine loves somewhere between 1.6 to 1 rod ratio and 1.9 to 1 rod ratio. There are some out there in the 1.4s. There are some engines out there in the 2.0s or higher rod ratio. And there are people read in all the books, the Power Secret books and the Smoky Unit books, telling you that you got to have a longer rod. And this is how I figure out my rod length. I do the bore. I do the stroke. I figure out where the cam goes. I figure out where the push rod goes. And then whatever's left... I get the tape measure out, and I say there's room for a five-inch rod between the crank and the piston. And it does not matter, y'all, if the pro-stop motorcycle, Suzuki, like Steve Johnson runs, it's got a 3.525 bore, it's got a 2.89 cubic inches, uh, inches of crankshaft, and it has a 4.8 rod length, and that's a 1.65 rod ratio. A pro-stop car, I think it's somewhere around a six-inch rod with a... 8.8 .8 deck height, maybe a 9-inch deck height. I don't know what the deck is now, but it's under 9 inches. So you add all the pieces together, half the stroke, the rod length, and the compression height from here to the top of the piston. And it has to come up to that overall length from the uh, of 8.8 uh, .8 inches or 9 inches of, of deck height. And when you get the piston correct, now let me say this. This is more important than the ring, I mean than the rod length, this area right here. This compression height. This is very important. What kind of room you got here from the center of this wrist pin to the top of this piston. This one's about 1.2. And I'm not using a tape measure to blueprint my engine. I'm just using it as round numbers. But you get, if you have a 6-inch rod and 1.2 um, compression height, that gives you 7.2 from the crankshaft to the top of the block, and the rest is stroke. Pro stock car, let's say they have a, I'm just gonna put this down here and figure it right quick. Let's say they have a six inch rod divided by a stroke of 3.53 equals. That's a 1.70 rod ratio. That's uh, pretty common. That gives a 1.7 rod on a pro stock car would give you room for the real estate. You need to do a good job with these rings. And before I hang up, the top ring will be placed based on where the fire is going to be and how much fire the ring can stand. The second land is going to be in a place where it's strong enough to hold the top ring up because all the pressure, all the pressure sits on top of this second ring. So wherever the second ring is, which is your oil scraper, is the the second land holds the top land up. The top land just locates the ring away from the fire. Second land holds the top ring up. And then we have a little teeny weeny little land to hold second ring up and then we have room for the oil ring. And then I make this really little right here because it's wasted space for the wrist pin. So the pro stock car guys do a great job. They put smaller diameter wrist pins in. That way they can squeeze this up 
and get the deck shorter or put the rod length they want in it. All right, I shoved a lot. I shoved, shoved five pounds in that one pound bag, but God bless y'all, man. Thank y'all for watching. Again, I want you to please understand, I just gave you a lot of opinions. These are mine. All right, that doesn't mean it's the only way to go. These are just my way. And I love you to tell me otherwise. I love you to give me your opinion or at least have a conversation with me on why I might not be right because I don't, I don't, uh, I don't claim to be correct about all this. I just know this is things I learned the hard way. I ran over all these parts. I blew up all these parts, and I learned all this stuff that way. May God bless y'all. Um, I'm going to do the Engine Expo conference in Bristol this week, um, I think I get to be a guest on Thursday. It'll be broadcast all over, everywhere. Um, check my Facebook page, and it will have the address of where to go to see it. Uh, Warren Johnson, John Kazi, and myself, a couple other heroes are going to be there that I look up to. Um, I hope to go over to the racetrack at Bristol on Friday and look around, say hi to some folks, and just um, I'm blessed to be here. Tech Talk 115. Stay tuned next week. I hope I have some really cool things to share with you on Tech Talk 116. Like I said, may God bless y'all. Have a good night.